Slava Turishev. Uh, Slava is an astrophysicist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California, uh, California Institute of Technology, and a professor at the Physics and Astronomy Department of University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Turishev earned his uh, MS in Physics with honors and a PhD in quantum field theory from the Lomonosov Moscow State University, Russia in 1987 and 1990 correspondingly. In 2008, he earned the Doctor of Science degree habilitation in astrophysics from the same university. His primary research areas include gravitational and fundamental physics in space, research in relativistic astrophysics, astronomy, and planetary science. He's an expert in high-precision spacecraft navigation, solar system dynamics, satellite and lunar laser ranging astrometry, and related technology efforts. Dr. Turishev served as the NASA project scientist on the CNES ESA Microscope Mission 2016 to 2020. JPL project scientist for the Advanced Lunar Laser Ranging Facility at the Table Mountain Observatory, CA, uh, 2015 to uh, uh, until uh, today. Principal investigator on the investigation of the Pioneer Anomaly, 2003 to 2012. He was the principal investigator on the 2020 NIAC Phase 3 effort on the mission concept studies to use the solar gravitational lens for multi-pixel imaging and spectroscopy of exoplanets. He has published over 220 papers, two books. Dr. Trishev is a member of the International Academy of Astronautics. Today, he will be speaking on big science in small packages, emerging science opportunities with solar selling small sets on Past solar system trajectories. So, Maitumi, thank you very much for the introduction. It is it is my pleasure to be here in Boulder. I always wanted to be here, especially in the fall, because in live in California, we totally missing that we there are multiple seasons in nature. We have only one, we actually four hot, very hot, extremely hot, and unbearably hot. <laughs> so, but here we actually uh, we can enjoy very different seasons and really enjoy what we're going to provide. So thank you for bringing me here. Today I will be talking about something that we developed at the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory over the last, I would say, five years, working on something that we uh, like to work on uh, the solar gravitational lens. And I will bring, uh, I will give you a little introduction of what that is. But my main uh, out outline for this talk would be uh, is here. So basically I will provide the motivation why suddenly I'm interested in solar sails because in the past, you know, solar sails are not known for precision navigation. And for me, as you as you heard, I'm interested in navigating our inside lander exactly on the North Pole of Mars, so that the landing where, 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 it's, where it's supposed to land. So, and uh, multiple other uh, objectives, but solar sailing is something that we uh, we, we think we will uh, offer in very new capabilities. So we'll talk about the history of solar, sail, uh, so solar sails, uh, physical principles, I will provide you some uh, sort of outlook as to what those technologies uh, enable and what missions were flown and they're being developed. And uh, then uh, I will switch back into something that we actually gathered here to discuss. It's uh, light craft architecture. It's the architecture for solar sailing spacecraft that actually is the one that we think enables the precision navigation and will be uh, uh, will enable other uh, other uses for uh, multiple uh, science areas. We'll talk about this as well. And so realistically, so we'll talk about the, the science uh, that, that this the concept enables and so in the next steps. Uh, but before going there, the motivation. Primary, uh, this work is a result of our recently concluded uh, 2020 in, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concept Institute uh, phase three study and uh, on the solar gravitational lens. For the solar gravitational lens using the SGL for uh, imaging and spectroscopy of exoplanets. And I will briefly mention uh, why do we uh, care about this. So this is a group of people who worked on, uh, on this project for the last, I would say, five years, and especially for the last two. And uh, there are many, many organizations that are interested not only in the science. Science is very interested. It's, it's a nice dinner conversation to start with, talking about imaging of surfaces of nearby exoplanets. And you see kids 
kids' eyes are excited to see something that is very, very important. And so, but then also uh, this area, if we, if humanity will fly a mission to the SGL, pushes all areas of technology, everything, autonomy, longevity in space, propulsion, uh, communication. And so here we'll talk about one element, which is uh, sort of the solar cell in the main proportion that we'll be using for the SGL. And so this is a group of people and organizations that were involved in the project and still are involved, and they are planning to stay involved with the different, uh, with the different uh, path that we are taking after the next phase three is over. So talking about SGL, look about, uh, just think about challenges. Our primary challenge is, of course, the tyranny of the diffraction limit. If you want to see uh, exoplanets at a very large distance, you need to have access to larger telescopes. This is wonderful selfie that Cassini spacecraft took of us, all people who live on this planet. Our planet Earth is right here, small dot here, right? So, but that the, the, uh, this is the uh, distance. So essentially, uh, the exoplanets are very far, so you need to have access to larger telescopes so that basically you need to gather more photons that are kind of, uh, coming to your camera. Then, of course, uh, another interesting similar picture, of course, the light amplification also comes from the aperture. So what you see here is the picture of us again. It's another selfie we took looking at us, uh, uh, Curiosity rover from Mars took that wonderful picture. But then if you look closely, you see that it's not only one dot. There are actually two objects there the moon and the earth. So we need resolution to see some very tiny, distant, not luminous uh, sources. And so, but moving forward, looking at the challenges. So we see exoplanets, our earth is small rock, third rock from the big star. And so we need to be able to block that uh, blob of light and to be able to resolve the tiny rocky planet that orbits nearby those, uh, those, those stops. And uh, now we have direct imaging of uh, exoplanets is a technique, but it is developed for super Jupiters. It's Jupiters, so this planets will be somewhere uh, on, on this scale will be much further. And that uh, those objects are orbiting their stars at about two, 220 to 40 astronomical units away. So, but not of those little things. Uh, for me living in Los Angeles, that's basically the primary effort here. If I want to take our own planet, I move it to 100 light years away, and I want to image that object with just one pixel. So I need to have access to a telescope with a 90 kilometers in diameter. That's basically tyranny of diffraction limit. And so this is JPL, of course, and this conveniently Dana point. So for those who are familiar with the LA area, you, you see the size of the telescope, you need to have one pixel. If you want to have multiple pixels, multiply that number by the number of desirable pixels. So that's the point. So re realistically, there is no technology currently that actually can be used to image exoplanets. We can go after, you know, wonderful uh, James Webb will provide a lot of interesting uh, in, in pictures, a lot of interesting data, there will be discoveries, but we will never be able to see the surfaces of those objects before we travel to them, right? And traveling there will take probably from now, maybe three, four, maybe, four, maybe two to 300 years from today, we will travel there. But now remote sensing is the only way to observe those planets. And that's where we come in. So re re realistically, we realize that, yes, the only way to do this is using uh, gravitational lensing. So in this chart, you see conveniently our stellar neighborhood, starting from on the left from the sun and going all the way to Alpha Centauri. And it's done, con again, convenient in logarithmic scale. Otherwise, you will see a lot of empty space. And so this is our neighbor. Going there, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a long path. And again, in the middle of that uh, chart, you see uh, the focal, uh, the area where the focal region of the solar gravitational lens begins. It's about 547 astronomical units out. So it's uh, several times more than Voyager covered. So Voyager today is at 154 astronomical units away from the sun, being launched in 1974. Uh, uh, so basically it took more than 40 years to get to this, uh, to this region. Today we have technologies that actually can shorten the travel time, but still it's very far. So practically we can fly spacecraft out there, but then re realistically, there is some technology gap that we need to jump through to actually enable those flights to those distant regions. So again, if we go to the focal region of the solar gravitational lens, and if we block the sun with a coronagraph, suddenly you will see something called Einstein ring that is formed from the light reflected uh, you know, the, uh, off the exoplanet. It comes all the way towards the telescope, which is positioned in the focal area of the solar gravitational lens, and you suddenly see the Einstein ring. So that object that I discussed, uh, our Earth, 
which is 13,000 kilometers in diameter, if I move it at 100 light years away, uh, the object will form an image within its cylinder with a diameter of 1.3 kilometers. So there is no single focal point. There is semi-infinite focal line. If I fly a spacecraft, I don't stop. I just go along the focal, focal line. I can collect moving one meter telescope point to point, pixel by pixel in the image. I can, I can make the images. I can take the data to image the exoplanet. And with this, just very briefly, because the, uh, the amplification uh, uh, parameters for the solar gravitational lens are very unique. We're talking about 10 to the 11th factor of amplification. You have nano-arc second resolution. And this is where, essentially, that image that we discuss of the, of the exoplanet, which is 1.3 kilometers, I can move uh, the telescope in that, uh, in that image and that uh, image pixel by pixel, essentially. Then we collect the image during the convolution, and I will be able to make surface resolution on that object about 20 kilometers, maybe 25 kilometers. Think about image on Boulder with uh, at least three pixels. So on that map, <laughs> think about this. So that's, this is the technology that actually allows us to do that. These are the simulations we have done. We studied extensively the optical properties of the solar gravitational lens. So essentially on the left, you see a regional image taken at sort of reasonable resolution. Earth, it's 128 by 128 pixels. In the middle, it's a convolved image of, the, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, original image with the point spread function of the solar gravitational lens. And that is the dec after deconvolution. So we're talking about uh, objects at 30 parsec away within a year of integration time, I can make an image that looks like this. And for the closer objects, uh, Alpha Centauri go all the way to five or three per sec. The images are much, much better. We're talking about megapixel resolutions. So that's why that this is the motivation why we want to go there fast. Now going there, we realize that we want to get the project started and reach those distances within the lifetime of a scientist or engineer. <laughs> so, because that's a primary concern. You want to uh, finish your, get your PhD, PhD, and get in starting your mission. And by the time you pretty much already in your mid years, your mid, mid career, you want to have the data already uh, sort of uh, provided to you by the spacecraft. So essentially talking about travel time about 20, 25 times. To get there fast, we need to move with uh, large or high velocities. So, and essentially the requirements is about moving faster than 20 astronomical units per year. What, what it means, Voyager travels with velocity now 3.1 astronomical units per year. We're talking about several times faster than Voyager uh, had achieved. And so, uh, though in, in, in a distance, uh, in a distant in, uh, in area. So we need to move fast. And so essentially people say, you either need to move fast or live longer, and I, I prefer, I say, I prefer to do both. And I wish everyone here <laughs> move fast a little longer because that's the only way to do a lot of good, good science here. And so we realized that solar sailing is uh, realistically the only capability that essentially uh, provides us with the, not only hope, but now practical way to actually get to those large velocities. Of course, you need to have a light spacecraft. When we are not talking about, you know, 700 kilogram spacecraft. It's not about this. We're talking about small science. And so this is where the ongoing revolution in small cells and uh, solar sailing and compact nuclear devices come, come together, provides us with a very interesting way to actually contemplate those missions. And so uh, potential targets with solar sailing can be outside the ecliptic plane, which is quite unique. With chemical propulsion, if you want to get close to the sun, you first go away from the sun to Jupiter. <laughs> and then Jupiter makes you a uh, gravitational maneuver. You can go like Ulysses, go outside the ecliptic plane, and then you can reach the reasonable distances and the inclinations. With solar sailing, you don't have to do this. You just go towards the sun, change your inclination. Every revolution you make, uh, about two to three degrees in 21 days. So if you position yourself at roughly 0.4, maybe closer even, 0.2 astronomical units. So I'm talking 0 0.4, 0 0.2. 0 0.2 would be the or orbit where uh, where we can actually enable survivability, thermal survivability of the instruments with the already available technologies. But you don't want to stay at this orbit. You want to move a little bit further away at, at, four, at let's say, 0.4 U. So, but even at, uh, with uh, going at 0.2 astronomical units, uh, th about three degrees uh, per 21 days, you can change inclination. So you can go polar orbit completely within a year. And so that's kind of the, uh, the, the likelihood of these technologies. And they really have uh, a lot of promise for us. And so moving forward, we looked at multiple technologies. Of course, 
solar sailing was never my kind of uh, idea to to do something in space. But suddenly, if you look at multiple technologies that are available, chemical propulsion is the most robust, most um, the highest TRL. We have flown so many missions using chemical propulsion, and especially looking at what uh, SpaceX is doing now with the Starship vehicle, where there, there will be a lot of power. So, but potentially, if you use uh, uh, chemical propulsion, you still we are still limited with about 15 AU per year. It's good, but still not 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 fast enough. Potentially, for that, we need to go close to the sun. We need to carry a thermal shielding, like you know, uh, like uh, uh, all the solar probe missions that were studied in the past. You need to carry solar shielding, and essentially, as you the the vehicle size is rather large, you do Earth maneuver when you go by close close proximity. And then you can reach those velocities of roughly uh, around uh, 15 astronomical kilometers per year. And we, we looked for that. Uh, this is uh, uh, Delta uh, the Delta Two heavy. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Delta Four. We, we looked at Atlas. We looked at the uh, Starship. So potentially all of these capabilities are within 15 AU per year. Then you can look about uh, think about thermal uh, solar thermal where you have uh, so, so energy is transformed so thermal energy transformed into propulsion as well so this technology is now lower technology readiness level trl is much lower but still there is a promise of getting 22 year per year at some point and so but the, of course the the challenges uh, of uh, how to build the spacecraft that will be surviving it will be moving slower rather close to the sun will be moving slower slower so you need to have a lot of thermal shielding on the spacecraft and so all the technologies of thermal shielding now greatly improved and so there is effort in the kennedy uh, space flight center so we have uh, very interesting technologies uh, lightweight so potentially there is also a path to do this um, then other te other technologies we looked at nuclear electric we looked at uh, you know electric sail so the TRL drops down significantly so potentially we realize that uh, if you want to wait until those technologies uh, um, will be developed then it will take maybe several several decades to get there and so this is uh, this is kind of our re rationale why why we decided to go with the solar sails themselves so it's not a new idea. Solar sailing is uh, was known is known for what uh, 400 years already. When Kepler noticed that cometary tails are being blown by the breeze by the sun, right? So he wrote to Galileo saying, "Look, we need to use that because they went in space. Let's use it for to propel our vehicles, heavenly made vehicles. We can do that." So that was 400 years ago. But back then there was no principle how to use how to actually benefit from those wings in space, right? So then it took uh, several several other many many individuals here. I'm list only four of them. Of course, uh, Maxwell came up with uh, equations for electromagnetic fields, and so now we know that there is a pressure. Light actually pushes, uh, so we know that it, it exists. Then uh, Peter Lebedev demonstrated light pressure in the laboratory, and that was in uh, 1899. Uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky suggested we have to use that light pressure. Now we have the mechanism. We actually start, we, we can think about building a, a, a spacecraft with a large sails to start move in, 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 in space. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, Friedrich uh, uh, Zander, he was the one who actually made the first technical analysis that yes, solar sails are a possibility, and that's how you do that. Or we'll do this. There are multiple other people uh, who contributed, of course, Einstein, because now photon carries momentum, so we know that. So uh, there is also uh, multiple people who wrote science fiction, like Schultz Verne. So they're moving in the universe with sails. So, but these people contributed to technical development of uh, of the sails. Uh, what do we know now? Uh, most of the work on solar sails was uh, was done uh, for the sails moving around Earth. And for to, to my taste, it's wonderful. But every boat wants to get to leave the harbor, want to go to the ocean. So most of the work that you you will see around, uh, uh, most of that is done uh, using the solar sails in Earth orbit. The principle is simple. You have uh, solar uh, photons so that are carrying momentum. When they interact with the sail, they, uh, there is momentum transfer. So the photons are reflected, and you have a net force that actually, you know, the um, uh, sunlight hits the uh, sail, and uh, a reflected sunlight gets a sort of uh, equal. If the sail is perfect, then the, the angle of incidence and angle of reflection will be the same, and so you will get a net force. And this uh, sailcraft will move like uh, like a sailboat in a sense, so because you have the wind now, no, not wind, solar radiation pressure, and so in uh, in Earth orbit we're talking about very small 
uh, uh, small uh, uh, pressures. We will be talking about the power density is about four uh, nanonewtons uh, per meter squared. Per meter square. It's a very tiny. It's a very tiny uh, pressure, and uh, essentially. Uh, the, uh, we are not interested in pressure, we're interested in acceleration. So acceleration, the larger the area of the sail and the smaller the mass of that sail, then you will get a larger acceleration. The area to mass ratio parameter is the key. And so what you will see in the next few charts, you will realize that people are starting to, uh, trying to build as large sail as possible. And then the smaller spacecraft in the middle, uh, because you need to uh, maximize the area to mass ratio. And so that's basically the main idea. Uh, here around uh, around Earth, as, uh, as I say here, so basically it's uh, the pressure on the sail, what is about four, uh, on, 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 on from the solar radiation pressure, it's like a house fly. <laughs> it's the weight of a house fly. It's very tiny. You need to get close to the sun because this is where you will actually benefit from the solar radiation pressure. Now, uh, this is the uh, basic sail craft design. What you have, typically you have a small sat, and the small sat concept came only recently, as, you, as we are aware. So the small sat revolution started about 15 years ago. Now we can contemplate thinking about highly, highly dense, very dense, uh, uh, small, very capable sp uh, spacecraft in a very small vo uh, form factor. So the small uh, uh, cell craft is here. You have uh, booms, four booms. You have a deployment in the middle. So essentially from that middle uh, compartment, there is deployment mechanism where carbon fibers uh, uh, booms are extracted from the sail and they're now sturdy. And so the, this is how the booms are made. So they have to provide rigidity for the for the sail. And then uh, basically that's that's how typical sail craft look like. And so these are the examples of those sails that were built over the years. So you see that so this, this, this was the program. Besides uh, uh, square sails, there is uh, there are some uh, uh, heli gyros, there are vein. I will not be talking about them. So, but basically, square sails are the uh, where the technology is highest. So, multiple uh, multiple companies involved, multiple NASA centers were involved in developing those uh, sails. In California, we worked with a company called Lagarde that has a unique capability of actually building the very uh, light uh, 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 sail craft. And um, these days, uh, the sail development went into a very interesting area. Now many European space companies are using sails to de-orbit uh, de their spacecraft. Essentially, you open up sail, suddenly you increase your drug, and in a few months you, you, you burn the atmosphere. Very easy. So it's very easy. It's a small, it's a small additional compartment to your, to your spacecraft. Once your primary mission is over, off, you're off the orbit by just opening the sail and you're done. Very clean way to actually burn everything, and so that, that that's so. This is where the sail development went into Europe uh, um, before actually uh, they will become um, uh, the the, the sail uh, before the sail started to be used for propulsion purposes for the orbiting. So moving on, uh, uh, the uh, Planetary Society had launched uh, in California. Uh, Planetary Society had launched uh, several uh, sail craft. This is a typical. Uh, sort of again structure of the sail craft. You see, it's about six six by six meter uh, 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 s s sail with a small uh, what is uh, two, uh, two, uh, two 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 cubesats in, in, inside. So the very very light structure. They have launched two uh, missions. One mission uh, now is operational, still moving high of uh, orbit, and uh, essentially provides a lot of interesting data on the sail performance. Uh, speaking about the booms, yes, please. Can you say anything about the, the weight or, the, or even the thickness of the sail itself? You will see a lot of data. Just okay. <laughs> if, if you won't see those answers, uh, just ask me again because there will be a lot of numbers. I'm just I'm building the momentum <laughs> to the, so slowly but surely. So these are the booms. Uh, booms are developed in Marshall uh, Space Flight Center. It's a technology funded by NASA. Very light, extremely light, very sturdy. So uh, uh, Johnny Fernandez is in the middle. He is running the program for, for Marshall. And so they have developed the deployment mechanisms right there. So deployed sail, you, you, just to see for, for comparison, the, 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 the aircraft jet there. So they deploy and uh, show how, how it works. And so most of those efforts, as I mentioned, for, the, uh, for primary purposes of moving maybe from mid-Earth orbit to high-Earth orbit, 
now there is an emphasis on going to a lunar environment. Now you can actually start flying Amazon delivery truck between high Earth orbit to the lunar environment. Because now you can actually, uh, I guess I'm running ahead a little bit, because now you can use sales, uh, multi-purpose use of uh, solar sailing, not only for propulsion, but you can embed photovoltaics in the sail structure. So you derive power from the sun directly. And also you can use uh, phase arrays. So now you can use it for communication. And uh, those elements are small, they're very lightweight. So the, these days, sail actually quite capable. You not only use it for propulsion, but for communication and power. So this is it. Infinite uh, longevity in a sense, because up there it's only what small meteorites that actually hit the surface, maybe break it. Otherwise you can move, move between Earth and the sun. I mean, uh, sorry, between Earth and the near, and the near, and this lunar environment going up there and down, so pretty much very easy. And so that's something uh, which is uh, picking up because of the momentum going to the moon. So solar sails will be around the moon doing just that. So uh, moving on, um, uh, those sails, historically, multiple organizations, many strands, uh, many countries actually developed those sails. Uh, the first sails here in 1976, I think Mariner 10, uh, JPL wanted to use sails to essentially for attitude control. And so it was a little bit complicated at the time, decided to, to discope, so the, the effort canceled. Then it was Helicom, I remember Carl Sagan on um, uh, uh, Johnny Carson's show, he actually had shown the square sail and the planetary society actually went to start building the square sails, start flying uh, essentially the flu, um, and then uh, 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 flew two so, so solar sails uh, by now. So then in Russia, there were a couple uh, sail projects in uh, late, uh, early 90s. So there was deployment from a Mir station. It was an interesting deployment. Essentially, the sail was deployed, but what was, what was not really operational, but it was provided a lot of sunlight to the Arctic regions. <laughs> so essentially, so somewhere above the polar circle where full night right during winter full night suddenly people wake up like beam of light coming from space <laughs> it was was very interesting here kind of a, an unintended use of solar sailing to provide light in the, in the northern regions <laughs> i think after that i think swiss government thought about putting something up there so that in the winter it will be a shiny light in the valleys in uh up so that the idea was discovered sort of was not picked up but the idea was kind of interesting so then it was a lot of deployment done um by multiple organizations uh planetary society actually went to uh, russia back then they uh, wanted to use the uh sort of decommissioned icbm to, for, for that and they launched from sub from submarine or Kangalsk submarine they went and of course all the icbms were sort of trained to go in the range where they have to hit so they didn't reach the space, but they successfully hit the, the, the range in, in Kamchatka. So instead of going to space, so unfortunately, it, uh, the, the first flight was not successful. And so then uh, a, lot of, a lot of interesting development happened in Japan. So my many suborbital deployments, uh, sort of the sail deployment mechanism to show that you can actually, actually deploy, it was a, a very success, a successful. What was interesting is, is, is keeping the, the entries here in Japan, Icarus spacecraft was launched from uh, from Earth. Then, with a little uh, 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 with a little C three, uh, went towards Venus. And so then, this uh, sailcraft opened the sail, and essentially they were able to sail to Venus. So uh, sailcraft went to Venus successfully, demonstrating not not only the solar sailing propulsion, but also they were able to demonstrate. Uh, uh, power from the photo, uh, from, from the photovoltaic elements embedded on the on the cell structure. So Icarus was very successful in that sense. And of course, in 2019, uh, Light Sail 2 was successfully deployed by be, being launched, I think, Falcon Heavy. And so it was deployed and actually uh, still in operation. So then uh, did, did different, uh, uh, some of the numbers you were asking for. And so I'm not talking yet about the, uh, the sail, uh, uh, thickness of the cell usually it's on a scale of uh, one to one to two microns so but very lightweight and a few grams uh, per meter squared so that's basically a very, very light material so many uh, many countries involved in this uh, Germany invested heavily DLR done a lot of interesting successful experiments sail construction building and essentially uh, they use it now for the orbit uh, the sail craft but a little by little they actually very much interested to start taking sails out from the high Earth orbit, moving, moving, moving further. So again, uh, Oceanus in the future, 
uh, two, two missions that we are waiting to be launched. One is, of course, near Scout, which is now sits on the Cape Canaveral, waiting for the maiden flight of Artemis. So the SLS will go first. And so uh, near Scout is on the in, uh, is on board. So it will be the, the, the next mission that will be flown. Uh, it will be done uh, by at, at near Scout. Another mission that uh, being developed by uh, uh, Marshall, it's a solar cruiser. So we are waiting for the conclusion of their sort of, of uh, their efforts. Hopefully they will fly maybe 2023, no, not clear, but basically uh, a little bit, a little bit pushed away uh, by, by timing. Interesting development in Japan, Okeanos wanted to fly a series of missions that essentially go rendezvous with asteroids and actually developing, going all the way to, I uh, believe, to a Jovian system. Essentially going all the way, it will be solar sailing plus uh, uh, plus nuclear uh, nuclear power on the spacecraft with little rover as well. So that they're using now they they building in on the solar sailing capability that were demonstrated by uh, by Icarus. There is a first entrant into the area from the commercial space. French company Gamma was able to raise to to two million euros, and they will fly probably in a few in in couple of weeks first orbit uh, in. Uh, Low Earth orbit to deploy the sail. Next year, they, uh, they, uh, they, they will start moving towards the cislunar uh, uh, environment. And then they're planning to go in the 26, I believe they, they're going to Venus in 2024 with this, with the solar sailing primarily. So that's a commercial company raising money now. So that actually gives you an indication that technology kind of getting to the point where commercial uh, companies actually start seeing this as a potential viable uh, way of uh, making business. Moving on. So uh, this is a summary of different uh, sail uh, projects, uh, sail craft, uh, starting from Nano Sail D in 2010. Uh, partial deployment, uh, so the was deployment was not really successful flight. Icarus interplanetary flight, and so this is the masses of the spacecraft, uh, total spacecraft plus the area, uh, uh, sort of the area of the sail, and so all of those parameters that you're asking. So they're pretty much some of them are here. And then uh, again, we are looking for so the light sail uh, planetary society, which is in orbit. I want to bring your attention to the fact that uh, to for the future sail craft, you want to have the sail surface will be under tension, so that to enable uh, the thrust vector control, the sail sail must be uh, under tension. You see sagging here. It was not done. It was just showing that we can deploy and operate sails up there. It was not for precision navigation. The future sails must have uh, 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 very uh, uh, must have planarity uh, uh, preserved very carefully. So you need to have a sail under tension, so you will be able to enable uh, variability in the thrust vector control. And so that uh, this is very important. Summary here is that it's a propellantless uh, propulsion, has a lot of promise, a lot of technology uh, development done by NASA, by JAXA, by DLR. Uh, French company, uh, ESA also invested in it. S suddenly things starting to come together, like uh, lightweight small uh, spacecraft, uh, sail materials, a lot of uh, flight proven avionics. And now you can start putting things together. And uh, the challenge for, 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 for that community, for the engineering community, the challenge is that the missions are funded by, uh, has to be, it will have to be science driven. So the science community must embrace this technology and start providing a momentum into this because technology available now science it's our it's on our part we need to support that community and start building something together because this is the only way to bring funding from nasa for example it has to be science driven so uh coming back to our activities one of our activities in the solar gravitational lens project was to develop something called a technology demonstration uh mission tdm the reason was to show okay we have a wonderful optical properties of, for the solar gravitational lens, but how really you can reach there? And so we said that we will develop technology demonstration mission that will demonstrate those technologies to for fast solar system transit. And so the three enabling uh, technologies, as I mentioned, the, uh, the interplanetary, interplanetary uh, small sats, and uh, we'll be all familiar with Marco, uh, a project that was built by JPL, uh, two small uh, six U CubeSat were flown together with uh, Psyche. Uh, in, inside inside lander, so one inside was uh, landing on Mars. The two little guys were actually taking the data in real time and transmitting data back to Earth from their small antenna on uh, on the CubeSat the CubeSat form factor. So the cost of first mission was about nine million. The second uh, mark mark would be I think was three million. The total project cost was about sixteen million. So we're talking about completely different prices, and so uh, that is very 
it's a good number that usually is not discussed by the community because we used to you know <laughs> uh, missions uh, that will be in hundreds of millions of dollars maybe uh, talking about astrophysics you can billions of dollars so but now is there is a little gap being developed there is little opportunity for really low cost missions there so the idea is that the, uh, another mission of course near scout will be uh, uh, launched soon so we hope that uh, we, 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 we wish that uh, that mission will be successful deploying will start show, showing the capabilities of solar sailing it actually will visit with the asteroid and will be moving and taking pictures of asteroids so it actually could quite nice enabled by, by, by solar sailing primarily then of course uh, solar sailing technology is enabled um, uh, by uh, uh, was pro was flight proven by Icarus, Light Sail, uh, by Planetary Society, and other 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 companies. Mm -hmm. There is interesting development in uh, nuclear power because everything that we discuss here, when we fly within, let's say, two astronomical units away from the sun, we can take photovoltaic elements, embed on a sail. We don't need anything. We can use the sun for to power for, to to power our systems. But if uh, we go further away, if you go to let's say five U, this is where again uh, the sail size help, but you don't want to cover all the sail area with the photovoltaics because you still need to get to the sun. <laughs> it's not good. So only part of that area. So when you go beyond five U, this is where you need some nuclear autonomous uh, power sources. There is a development in community uh, that is actually uh, building planar, very lightweight. Uh, uh, elements uh, nuclear elements coming uh, starting from the RHUs, radioisotope heating units now and they joined with batteries so you can actually store a lot of energy on board of the spacecraft and so that is uh, something uh, very unique and this is what we are betting on essentially because these technologies are being developed and some of them already flight flight proven this is a little bit uh, behind i would say trl4 so but soon this will it's it's driven now by multiple uh, uh, departments of, of the government so I think that this will be developed uh, pretty much in the next three to four years. So missions beyond fiber U will be uh, also uh, possible with this concept. Moving Can on. you remind me which uh, NASA center is doing NEA scout? Uh, <laughs> the scout, uh, Marshall. 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 It's uh, a Marshall Space Flight Center. Okay. Langley involved in other, other development. Uh, so, uh, the, so. Yeah, okay. And the JPL used to be part of those efforts, not now, but we are building that effort with GVS and JPL as well. So little by little, those centers will be uh, more uh, receptive to, to apply. And in fact, STMD has a technology development program. So essentially to support uh, deployable bomb technology, lightweight and the solar sailing. So STMD is uh, fully supportive for, for solar sailing missions. Moving forward, so okay. these are the planar sails, which we discussed just brief, uh, briefly. Um, so the planar sails are great, but they are not really capable to deliver the capabilities that we need for our technology demonstration mission. Um, uh, the point here is the area to mass ratio. If you see this chart, the current, uh, the, the current chart, uh, the, the current spacecraft, sailcraft, have uh, area to mass ratio of roughly two meters squared per kilogram. Within our program that we have done for the last four years, we have essentially developed the uh, sail craft that is now at the, at the level of 25 uh, meters uh, squared per kilogram. So area to mass ratio much larger and the weight is very different. So this is our, uh, our path to reach SGLF threshold velocity. We need to move fast. We need to move at 20 AU per year. So, but uh, th this is the uh, range for the technology demonstration mission. We get in, we get in there and we will start flying with the uh, area to mass ratio for the spacecraft architecture at the level of roughly at uh, uh, 25 to 30 uh, area to mass ratio. So moving on, there are challenges with the planar sails. Uh, remember there is a deployment mechanism, it's a parasitic mass, you bring it up there and you still, you deploy it and it stays. You need to deploy and drop it, but we don't drop it because the, uh, the, it uh, supports the booms. There was uh, developed, there, there was a, mechani a mechanism developed at uh, DLR where the sails is deployed by four motors running on the on 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 the on the booms, and then once once the motors reach the end of the booms, they dropped. Again, it's kind of a lot of tricks uh, developed by the community to reduce the mass. You you need to remove the mass because deployment of large sails is very very difficult. Then the uh, thrust vector control is difficult because you need to keep the sail structure under tension. And if you unfold, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the four quadrants, how to keep the tension for the, between the quadrants, it, it's, it's a challenge there. So this is why we decided to step away from this. And we used something that was developed by, by, uh, by uh, Sunjammer. Sunjammer used some little veins on the tips of the booms 
to, to articulate articulatable veins to control the uh, attitude uh, of the cell craft. And NASA loved that because basically that is actually solving so many problems. Now you have uh, articul articulatable vein structure that allows you to compensate for any disturbance in the spacecraft. That was the primary idea. <coughs> Moving on, uh, within our effort, what we went from, from this structure and all the way to, to this, you have now two, uh, two uh, planes with uh, three articulatable veins, and essentially each vein is uh, individually articulated. Now it's fully, uh, it looks like a sailboat. Remember on a sailboat, what you have, you have solar wind, you have the sail, which you can uh, actually uh, orient in the most advantageous way, and you have a rudder, so that your sailboat actually can go almost against the wind. So with the sailcraft like this, we have solar radiation pressure, we have articulatable veins, and we have reaction woods. So now you have a full autonomy on the sailcraft plus computer that will tell where spacecraft to go. So now you can, change a uh, little, little uh, you can be a little bit more aggressive on the uh, on the angle of attack of individual sail and you can compensate for unwanted rotations and deployment very easy and again deployment is i will show the elements of deployment of that so but very simplified deployment the articulatable veins to enable control so that's the main idea for this type of a sailcraft now it's like a umbrella when you go outside of the when you travel outside the hotel you, you see a lot of uh, box with the umbrellas you pick one umbrella you open up and you out. So similar here, you travel, you put your vehicle, the uh, length, uh, length of the booms uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the veins determined by the length of the truss. So you have a truss essentially in folded position, individual veins are collapsed. And so once they're in space, they're basically one simple, de simple deployment. They're collapsed and fixed. Uh, they're opened and, opened and fixed. And so that, 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 that's the primary idea that actually was, was used to the design. I will show a little bit more on that. So that's the evolution of that idea. It started from those uh, Sandrake and um, uh, what is the Sanjammer idea. Then it was the beginning of our effort. Now we use diamonds, uh, diamond structure. What it means is that essentially we have a middle uh, a small truss, which is not structurally important, but to keep the tension. But the length of individual segments is the same. It's equal to the length of the truss of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the sail craft. And again, everything is individually articulatable. And so that, 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 that's a primary advantage. Now let's talk about some, some numbers here. So we want to achieve velocities of roughly six to eight astronomical units per year. And the design I'm talking about is designed with this objective. So we also want to have significant area to mass ratio. Remember the current sales uh, sail craft has uh, have uh, uh, area to mass ratio on a scale of two, be improved by, by a factor of 25. The design already that we have, I will show you uh, some pro prototype, which is already 25. And so the 50 will be the next, uh, uh, within the next step. So, and that, you're talking about the error to mass ratio of the sail itself, not of any payload, right? Everything together. That's including a payload. Including the payload. The idea is that, that uh, we can, I mean, when I'm talking about area to mass ratio, it's area of the sail to the total mass of the space. Okay. So then we have to, uh, that actually pushing us scientists now, because that pushes on us how much mass can we squeeze in. Because the, you, one way of reaching so area, uh, a large area to mass ratio has spacecraft with zero mass. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so but being practical, the smaller the mass, the better. So it's not, now we're talking about miniaturized instruments, very compact redundancy on on board. So a lot of things we need to be smarter because the the volume, sort of the um, the the. The, the the design envelope getting smaller and so but still for for this vehicle the total mass of that sail craft is uh, under six kilograms and so that is what will be uh used in the next three years uh two years i'm sorry that th this is what we are ready to fly and so essentially we also bring in up to one kilogram payload for this tdm for, for this for this mission it's a one kilo payload, includes probably a magnetometer, probably a camera, probably some other particle detectors, because we do know small, small instruments that can be that lightweight, to a few hundred grams, right? So there's some MEMS accelerometers, so there's some other things which we can squeeze into initial TDMs. It's not a science mission, it's yet to demonstrate the capability. Once we show that, then it's a totally, a totally different discussion because nobody has flown around the sun. Once you do that, surviving the sun, and that, that this is important. And then you demonstrate that, yes, you can do that. So essentially, a lot of uh, leverages, a lot of flown avionics, especially Marco 
and so well, the flight of uh, flight processor of uh, flight processors uh, software defined radios and all of that so I will talk about this in the next few charts so the idea how we fly essentially there are a few phases within this mission we can start from uh, a high earth orbit uh, we don't need to be in atmosphere don't want to fight with atmosphere potentially we can but uh, ideally uh, if, if somebody will drop us in the cislunar environment better then essentially we open up uh, first check out and then we start autonomously flying towards uh, Venus essentially going to the inner inner solar system where we verify the autonomy we verify communication we verify a lot of uh, controllability of the sails and then we get into the uh, close perihelion during the close perihelion we need to verify the environment we are around perihelion the total time that takes from the, from earth to roughly uh, uh get into uh, the orbit of mercury is about six months then it's about another uh, a few weeks we get close to cl closer perihelion and at the closest perihelion we are about 16 hours so this is our thermal margin we need to be able to survive through this proximity 16 hours uh, close to the sun and then as we approach the sun we flow fly away uh, with a very large speed and then controlling articulate articulated winds so that's that's the this is the trajectory what we will be demonstrating in the next uh, next couple of years coming back to this vehicle design so essentially um uh, again it's uh, um, those wings are multifunctionals uh more multifunctional we have shape memory motors that control articulation and uh, they're embedded photovoltaics on the on the sail structure already. So it's uh, uh, essentially the uh, thin film phased arrays on the on the structure to enable communication. With the, so it's it's fully not only uh, propulsion but also of power and also communication already on the on, on the veins already embedded. So moving on, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, carbon fiber trusses. We have uh, software defined radios and the flight computers are proven. The TRL nine essentially what is not proven is all is the architecture of that, of that cell craft that's what we want to prove because everything else we the idea is that i didn't mention here so the idea for the tdm no development we buy what is available no development we don't want to develop anything because what we can do with the components already we can buy from the off the shelf from the from the companies so development will be integration everything uh, sort of uh, testing before flight uh, and then basically this is it, but no development in terms of materials or components or instruments, nothing. And so that's that. Uh, so uh, this is the TDM. Moving on, we built prototype of the TDM. So uh, one to three scale prototype. Veins are here in Lagarde. Then uh, the whole vehicle was assembled. One to three prototype, and essentially assembled, uh, was disassembled, moved to facility. Oh, what did that, another, another picture like this? And it was disassembled and moved to the facility of Explore in uh, uh, Washington. So not only we were able to assemble, but also disassemble and assemble it again. So means that those gossamer structures, not only we can carry them, but actually can uh, can, can, put, can put them together, which, which was kind of an, another important test. So with this, uh, we have done this. It was done in last, last year, essentially. So this vehicle is now on display in the Explore. Wonderful. Next step, we are, we are, we are raising money to start building uh, a larger scale now, uh, ready and uh, sort of almost getting ready to, to fly it. so it's a pre pre-flight prototype moving on we understand of course we are not dealing with only sales not only sales need to survive through solar uh, proximity all the structures everything has to survive right so the whole sail system is materials plus structures so everything that we have every joints every paint any bolt any 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 connection that we use must go must be able to sustain those thermal loads that the vehicle will go through and so interesting numbers for for, for you we, we talk about different materials right there are different materials that are now available mylar the thickness of the mylar 0.5 to 1 micro so the the aerial density is like under one, one gram per meter squared right and so essentially it, it survives temperature 240 uh 44 before it melts right we don't want it we, we don't want to do that this is why our uh, first TDM will go to the distance where we don't need to essentially we, we are not risking the, uh, the the vehicle burnout essentially right so we, we, we the, this is what drives our our mission design but then the other materials CP1 it's uh, uh, polyamide uh, thickness are larger but it actually can uh, sustain larger temperatures and then of course Capton uh, which is now another material can survive even larger temperatures so the point is that um, 
there is a lot of activity in the community driven by multiple efforts. One, of course, the breakthrough light, uh, light craft, they're interested to have a laser sail. So for them, they develop materials that will sustain a lot of thermal uh, load from the lasers. And so there is a, like another uh, entry in this table will be gaps, gaps, gaps. And that's somewhere here, there will be a laser sailed material that will sustain, uh, I would say thousands of uh, Celsius, thousands, couple of thousands of Celsius, because they are planning to deposit at least, uh, uh, I think it's about 120 gigawatt laser power on the four meter sail to be able to move it with the fractional speed of light. So, but I'm not talking about that project. I'm talking about so solar sailing only because this is what I think practically is possible in the next uh, 18 months. So it's ready. So that, uh, so this is what this, this materials are already available. This is this what we can buy now. You can go to M3 company, you can basically buy it today. So that, that, that this is the main point. Now we assembled that vehicle and we started testing it. And so if the if the surfaces are untreated, of course, a Lior, we, for, for the Lior environment, we are perfectly fine. Cislunar, no problem. Once we get in close to Mercury, then our cell structural elements will start uh, this, uh, to, 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 to see significant heat deposits. And the uh, star trackers and reaction wells are not happy either. So then we treated the surfaces with uh, uh, thermal treatment, essentially different paints and different, you know, tricks that we used in the industry. So with uh, with treatments, uh, we still saw a little hit pockets on the two uh, critical elements. And so those critical elements are star tracker and reactionables. We see these two pockets. And then we used multi-layer insulation on top of that. And so now we're fully green. And so essentially we are, we, we are surviving on multiple levels. So, but uh, I'm just showing something that we have done almost a year ago. Now those numbers are much smaller. So we can actually uh, in the, uh, ensure the sustainability of those elements. We pick different elements on the uh, uh, from avionics, from different uh, components that are available. So all of that is green, and I think uh, in many ways this is pretty much a done solution. We now need, need to start flying. So again, I showed that vehicle. Now I'm coming back uh, the last part of my talk. I'm sorry for an <laughs> extensive discussion, uh, but here is a uh, Sandever concept. Now, how can we use this vehicle? Suppose we are successful flying it. I, I, I hope you, 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 you wish us like we will fly it soon. So once we're successful, what, what this uh, concept enables? And uh, in my mind, uh, I guess we discussed multiple times, a fresh PhD graduate who is interested in getting into planetary physics, right? And she got her PhD and got uh, uh, admitted to, uh, to JPL, to, uh, to Goddard. I've uh, started thinking, uh, oh, so, Southwest Research, start thinking about flying her mission to Enceladus or further to, it takes about 30 years these days to go through proposal cycle, rejection, selection, uh, pre-phase, phase A, building. And then uh, by the time basically mid-career, she sees the launch, via launch vehicle with her instrument on the, on, the, on the launch pad, takes another 10 to 10 years to get to that uh, wonderful place where she wants to, to do the experiments. So this is why the, it's, a, it's a community that uh, actually dem uh, needs a very fast, uh, inexpensive uh, transit uh, to those distant regions. With Sun Divers, I think we will be able to provide part of that capability. Of course, we are moving fast. It's not orbiter, it's not, uh, it's not lander, right? But what can, what can we do with flybys? Or we can actually do a lot of interest in physics around the sun, we don't need to we need to land on the sun, we just orbit the sun. So the idea is that with TDM, when it reaches velocities of uh, five to six or seven astronomical units, we have the capability that we must, uh, can start using for something, I'm not saying a low hanging fruit, but something that we conceptually understand how to design and build. Heliophysics, so we're talking about solar polar imager, something that I think in many ways with your help, we will be able to develop and put appropriate instruments with this on, on this vehicle. I forgot to mention one number. The TDM cost is 17 million. 17 million. So we put another instrument, science instrument on it. So the TDM cost will be on a scale of roughly under 20 million. So for, including operations. So uh, that changes changes the paradigm of uh, any science mission. So realistically, to bring this mission at JPL will be challenging because uh, how many people can I support out of 20 million to 20 million that the project which is about what three years right or maybe two, maybe two years in development so realistically that's NASA centers want to have bigger projects and so now we're in, uh, working with uh, industry uh, that may be interested to step in and start flying and selling data uh, to, uh, to to NASA to NSF to 
uh, it's like data uh, will be uh, will be there will be price stuck on the data and the data is provided. The industry will step in, will start uh, thinking about this. So there is some different business model that, that can be arranged. But uh, moving forward, as we realize this capability further, then we can start thinking about other missions like Enceladus, going through the plumes of Enceladus. And so as you improve the navigation capability, you can go through the plumes and you have your either in situ detector, so they need to slow down, of course, but you can do a lot of things remotely as you go through the plumes, spectroscopy of the plumes. You can do something before a main flagship mission goes there. You can do, it's like a drone. So you can start flying inexpensive drones, not every 10 years as we used to do. Just th think about this, that uh, we have what, of five missions after after Pioneer 10, only five missions have flown beyond the orbit of Jupiter. And so Pioneer 10 was launched, what, 1972. And so it takes uh, how many years to get only five missions, right? So with this, we can start flying drones, essentially, inexpensive drones, but still uh, built by universities, built by different centers. Cost, cost uh, envelope very different. And, and then, of course, moving forward, my, uh, my, uh, my objective personal is to enable that transition so that solar gravity lens will provide us with those pictures of habitable exoplanets but it's a long road, long road towards that so that's what we think about this are uh, we putting together something um so basically the in in a different summary of this so in heliophysics uh multiple interesting uh, areas of heliophysics may be addressed and so we're thinking about solar or solar polar orbiters so 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 solar polar orbit because with solar sailing again we can reach any trajectory, any inflammation. It just takes a little time. And, uh, but at the cost of not hundreds of millions, it's very different cost. You can start orbiting the sun in the polar orbit, monitor solar activity, not with one, but with several of those inexpensive small sailcraft. So it's possible, technology is available. Then uh, if, if developing the capability of na navigation and longevity and onboard power, we can start flying those missions further and further, and then uh, exploring the uh, interstellar medium and going further away again with the cost with this reasonable cost. Planetary, uh, pl uh, planetary science uh, will get a lot of interest and benefits from this as well, because now you can address hard to reach asteroids, you can go through plumes of Europa and Celadus, you can visit with uh, uh, with other um, with other interesting destinations such as interstellar objects that have just started visiting us, uh, and essentially with the ISOs, you with solar sailing, you can you can reach those velocities uh, uh, that are needed to 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 to, inter, to, to reach those uh, ISOs, interstellar objects, and start sort of uh, uh, doing re remote investigations. Potentially multiple uh, ways of um, using those uh, missions. Uh, we can use, uh, uh, first of all, flight uh, for fast flybys, impactors. Think about flying two of those spacecraft. One spacecraft of the sacrifice spacecraft will carry uh, an impactor, will, will impact the, uh, with the ISO, for example. The other, the other one, the other one will, will carry a spectrometer and then will or imager. And potentially you can see how those uh, instruments will enable an in interaction with those objects that otherwise we will not be able to. And so essentially, the challenge for the community is, of course, as usual. Uh, usual, but now a little bit more severe in the sense that uh, small weight, uh, low power and small size, because we usually are being told, we like you, but you, you need to be smaller <laughs> and eat less, less power and be... <laughs> so, but, but now it's even uh, le uh, even more so. But that's kind of, it's, it's doable. So the mission that we, uh, that I just presented, the TDM, essentially we are ready to fly by May 24. We are raising money for that. And so we're raising money from the community, people like uh, you know, philanthropic organizations. So we're developing the white paper uh, that will summarize the scientific objectives. I'll just flash the, uh, the white paper. And so going through different areas, uh, heliophysics will highlight several areas there in, in, in the white paper because uh, we would like to make sure that is, uh, this uh, sun diver concept, that this concept of a fast uh, transit through the solar system at different inclination is uh, demanded. It's the actual response to the community needs. Moving on to the planetary sciences, and the planetary sciences, of course, there's so much science can be done. You look at the decadals that NASA Academy of Science is putting out, and how many of those interesting targets, opportunities, are actually uh, addressed every every decade. Not many, right? So there are lots of things. As you go away from the uh, for, for away from the sun, and the so solar system revolving gets larger. And so we need to explore all of that. And so with this, 
uh, exploring those little guys in the deep solar system. That would be amazing to see to fly by one of those KBOs, maybe interacting with those KBOs and see what it's uh, made of. And so then, of course, astrophysics, uh, ISOs, and I guess my, my, my personal uh, holy grail is here, so we want to go there, so to see the uh, image of the uh, ex exoplanets. So that's why moving fast and live longer, that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the idea. So uh, my last slide is here. So um, I hope I was able to give you, I don't want to convince anyone. I'm not here to convince, I want just to share. So if you're interested, that, that's kind of, I give you a little bit, a little grain of you know, thought think about this because I think this is, this may be interesting. So solar sailing becoming a reality and so they can reach a very large velocity. We are working now uh, to formulate missions that will be uh, attractive for multiple science communities, heliophysics, planetary sciences, astrophysics, working with multiple uh, sort of philanthropic organizations with breakthrough, with Schmidt Futures. Uh, so hopefully those uh, those organizations will be able to step in and provide some funding to initial initial missions. And then, of course, we bring a lot of industry uh, because industry seem to be too, uh, interested as well to step in and do, do things. For example, Virgin is interested to provide us with a free lunch, <laughs> which is not possible otherwise, right? So they're excited. So there will be some, uh, some, some interesting capabilities. This is our roadmap, the uh, roadmap uh, which uh, for the slow gravitational lens. So now we are 2022. We, have, uh, we are in the process of forming public-private partnership that will allow that transition, building those missions, start flying uh, those missions. And uh, in the next couple of years, we hope our TDM uh, flights will reach the need velocities at a reasonable cost. And 20 million for individually for each of us, it's not reasonable, but compared to the cost that we spent on research, uh, otherwise, maybe for the funding agencies, it may be acceptable in the philanthropic organizations. And ultimately, by, uh, by, uh, by 2060, by the time I'm, I will be approaching my 100 years old. So basically, by the time I'm 100, remember, move fast and live longer. So I want to I wanna live and, 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 and to the day when I will see the uh, image of exoplanets. So I'm on a manual mission. We, we need to move fast with this. So thank you very much. I hope uh, so. I, was, I, would, I gave you a little sort of background what it is. If you have questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much for excellent talk. Um, now it's open for questions and the um, online participants also can uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions. There was one question in the chat from Alan Brennan. Uh, can this method yeah, be used can... to allow low cost launches to soar orbit around 0.5 AU? Solar orbit or around 5 AU? Solar orbit around 0.5 AU. Yes, absolutely. Yes, can be done. Uh, for that, we will need to get to the sun. And then, I mean, there are multiple ways to use this technology. I didn't talk about all of them, but uh, answering that question gives me, the, gives me the opportunity. Of course, we are limited by the small mass of the payload, right? So the potential of the next step would be to use in-flight aggregation. Suppose you would have uh, um, your instruments are modularized and sort of like Lego blocks, right? You can basically plug them in and they move. So what you need to do, you fly several of those little, little small spacecraft. Once you reach the highest velocity already, drop the sails, you don't need them. And then with iron propulsion, or maybe drop the sail of every 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 sailcraft but one. One will still, the, still have the sails. And potentially by that time, you will dock the, uh, the spacecraft and they will form a, a more capable spacecraft. Potentially, you can have a little um, additional propulsion blocks with this technology. And so that is also possible. We're now building this sort of demonstration of that capability. So, uh, thinking about the 5AU five five orbit. So I uh, hear 5AU would need a significant, uh, very low uh, velocity in a sense. And I guess uh, re reaching that uh, velocity, I think, I think we, we, can do, we can use this solar cell to do this. And essentially, not only in the ecliptic plane, but maybe if you're interested outside the ecliptic plane, uh, let's talk about this, what science uh, that will uh, bring. But yes, the answer is yes. Other questions? I got one. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's not a question. It seems like one other kind of under, um, undeveloped potential application for this is using these sorts of things as solar concentrators for deep space. 
Um, and there, that could give you a huge lever arm on eye under closing. Absolutely. And in addition to that, uh, using diffractive sales, uh, there is a new effort uh, that is being developed in the University of uh, uh, Rochester Institute of Science and Technology, I think. So diffractive sales. Essentially, remember when the uh, uh, sunlight is reflected, uh, it's uh, incident on the, on the sale, it reflected off. And so then it's depending on the property of the sale, it, it will not be very efficient. If you want to concentrate that reflection in the diffractive sales, you put in diffract, uh, diffraction uh, sort of a uh, pattern on the on the cell structure so that you form a much tighter ref, uh, reflection. So th this is way a, a very effective mechanism to control thrust vector. So this is one thing. Second one, uh, you mentioned again uh, the solar concentrators for, for, for multiple reasons. And those efforts are being built, being discussed now. So in, um, but then basically it, it can be done on the, from the lunar surface, for example. So if you want to derive power to the moon, uh, one way is to go with, of course, nuclear elements. Uh, so, but uh, to get the launch approval for nuclear elements is quite difficult. So, but you can put on the Shackleton crater, for example, you, you can put a mast, open up 10 by 10, 100 by 100 meter sail, put it from a form of concentrator, and then you uh, sort of condense that energy in, uh, in, uh, in the element where you can actually start deriving uh, electrical energy from the heat originated. In the, we have studied this as well, it can, can be done also. I was thinking of deep space. It, this deep space uh, with deep space step step by step a uh, deep space i don't i agree fully i don't know how practically to implement it on the moon because we now seem to be going to the moon again and so with uh, some activities i see how it can be done in the high high uh, from uh, from leo to here i know how it can be done uh, this is this is the energy generation for a spacecraft mm -hmm. in deep space for it to use, say, ion testers. Um, um, I think there was recently a commercial done by, I think, Sony, like three weeks ago. For some reason, they used large sail craft, and they, there was a space race uh, between the humans going to Mars. And I think they opened this, uh, they opened the sails on the on 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 a sail on, on a spacecraft. And so they actually were use used that not only for propulsion but also for power generation as well. Right, but you could. Um, one of the problems with ion engines is that the amount of power density that you can produce, especially once you get away from the Earth, is quite low. But if you just take your solar panels and shine more light on them... Icarus demonstrated that. Icarus, uh, the, the primary idea for Icarus was really not the sailing, in my, in my, in my opinion, but it was the ability to derive solar power to drive the ion propulsion. Mm -hmm. So Icarus done exactly that. And now this is why Japanese are putting JAXA, is putting Okeanos mission uh, with solar sails is uh, using the solar sails as a power concentrator, so to speak, and use it for the uh, uh, for the electric propulsion. Bobby, do you want to uh, stop sharing so that the people can see the owl at work? I think. How do it? It's a stop, uh, stop There you go. Yeah. Okay. And then I think when we talk, well, maybe not. Well, yes. Uh, it depends on which uh, viewing mode you have selected on your computer. Oh, okay. I maybe well, just people can if they want to see the room. Myself. Okay. Just disconnect myself completely from from the meeting. Okay. Okay. And uh, there is another question from uh, Howard Singer. Um, good to hear about all the advances in solar cell science. Have there been studies to determine how well a magnetometer will work in the presence of a cell? I'm trying to understand why there there will be some uh, interaction between the magnetometer and the cell. I think Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. It's because of the magnetic interference uh, from the mm -hmm. cell. You mentioned the cell yes. having photovoltaics, for example. And I'm just wondering uh, if there will be, you know, currents provided developed by the sail structure that will interfere with the magnetic field measurements. Uh, the pho thank you for the question. The photovoltaics, uh, photovoltaic elements will be occupying only part of the sail. We don't need to occupy the entire sail, and so uh, there will be no currents on uh, the other parts of the sail. And so, if you put a, a magnetometer at the end of the boom, 
of one of the uh, trusses or of, on the truss or, or the vein, there will be no interference. Okay, thank you. I think we have a magnetometer at JPL, which is about 600 grams. And so we think about using something like that for, uh, for um, uh, studying. I guess what was surprising for me personally was the multi-purpose use of those cells, because you can now use not only for propulsion, but for power generation and also for communication, which is kind of very similar, right? And so that is uh, for the inner solar system missions. I think that is enabling capability in many ways. And because we now derive all this capability, just blind them, right? So you can spray those uh, those elements on the, on the structure of the cell. Technology evolves significantly. And so with this, you actually can, can have a lot of benefits for the missions that we would like to fly. And I guess maybe just the last point here, uh, you probably, you saw multiple structures, I guess, our primary uh, primary contribution to the field is the articulatable veins because no parasitic mass now the con uh, control thrust vector and uh, um, so it's easy to deploy and uh, enable precision 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 navigation that other uh, sales uh, have not yet demonstrated primarily because they were focused on the only on the uh, earth orbiting uh, trajectories now once you leave the harbor you go towards the sun this is a little bit different environment. And I do expect there will be other uh, people in that area who will be stepping in. And we're talking now with uh, several European companies who are interested in, in stepping in and do something like this. Another question? Yeah, I want to ask a question related more to uh, local, more local um observations like within the solar system in our inner heliosphere specifically to do with space weather um can you use sails this way to like uh, you put a number of these things somewhere near say half an au can you can you uh, to use a sailboat analogy you know with a sailboat you can kind of tack against the wind and move all around can could you do that where you could keep a whole bunch of these things near the sun earth line or near the sun jupiter line or, or sun planet line uh, you can form trajectory that will not be uh, sort of static, but uh, can move around the sort of uh, uh, the point where it wants to stay. It will not stay at one point, but move move around with the articulatable, articulatable veins. But if, you had, if you had several, you could kind of time things so they yep. you'd have some where you want them, right? Yes, that can be done. But 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 it more like more or less like a fixed heliocentric radius, like half an AU or something like that. Uh, there is still energetically they are not very um there there is another concept i think you probably heard of it called a uh, statit where you basically compensate you hover using solar radiation pressure you completely compensate uh the so uh, the you completely compensate the orbital velocity the, your orbital velocity around uh, against the sun is zero but you can kind of you compensate the uh, the potential energy by just hovering on the solar radiation pressure and that was uh, that concept studied was extensively studied that it, 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 this is not feasible. So you need to have a large, very large sail. Uh, potentially, what is feasible is doing what 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 which I discussed, but moving on uh, some sort of a circle around that point, and and and, and that is feasible. So we can use uh, several of those small instruments, so small small spacecraft, to, uh, to 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 do just that. So that is possible. Oh, interesting. Thank you. How big of a circle are you talking about? Uh, honestly, we have not studied that. So I, I cannot answer those questions specifically. I know that there is a reasonable orbit will be on a scale, uh, I would say maybe half a million kilometers, or maybe even smaller, but it, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's, a, it's a large orbit. <laughs> so we but, have to convert that to an AU or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, compared to an AU, it's point half a percent. It's, uh, half a percent, okay. That the sun is a million kilometers, so basically it's a fraction of the sun. So that is uh, still still point, it's a small point, right? So if you wanted to hover at the sun's poles, you thought you could do something like that. Yes, yes. Yeah, I Just, think the station keeping capability in hard to in places where other orbital approaches make it difficult. I think that's the that's really a strong point for this technology is to be able to station do a solar sitter a solar polar sitter 
mm -hmm. idea, even if it's moving in an orbit that's a, you know, a circle, a halo orbit around the pole, or some sub L1 point, I think you were talking about, that's mm -hmm. not really at an L Lagrangian point, but still can station keep around a location that's difficult to do so otherwise. We have studied a similar orbit on the Earth pole, poles, North Pole, so station keeping up. Yeah, yeah, North that's pole. right. Similar. For the Sun, we have not looked at this, but pre principle is the same. So, uh, isn't it a big challenge, though, that for all of the solar cells that we're talking about here, the, um, the, the thrust from the um, from the solar radiation pressure is much, much less than the than the sun's gravity. You mean around the around Earth? So, uh, the, so for the Earth, we need to have a, a, a large sets. No, 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 no. That the selenium will be much larger compared to what we are aiming for the TDM. But even for the sun at 1 AU, um, it's, it's much less than the sun's gravitational fold, right? Or, so for this, we would need to, uh, we looked at this, I think the sail, uh, a sail thrust would be um, at least four times larger than we have now, about 50 meters. And it's still, uh, we are um, kind of, Around this, around the sun, I think it, 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 uh, this can be formed uh, with the reasonable uh, area of this cell. Uh, and reasonable, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, we have not looked at the real number there. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting, interesting discussion. We have not thought about uh, putting this in the, the station keeping around the sun. Around Earth, we can do that. Uh, but that's maybe some with a little iron proportion, a little bit to, 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 to help. But around the sun, that is maybe also using the iron propulsion uh, because you know well, the, the argument that Joe you suggested using you can you, exactly you, you can now derive the power directly. So the so sails will be used not for the propulsion, but basically for deriving power. The problem with iron propulsion is you do have there you have to worry about the sun, um, which one is the amount of delta V, mm -hmm. um, which if you're trying to Probably not place very soon for your time, like years. It's constant yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, I, so I think it's not not an answer there. Um, not that I, yeah. But see, uh, sales will allow you, we can sort of address this problem piecewise. Without sales, we will not be able to get there. So with sales, we can get there, right? And so compared to chemical propulsion, it will be already a benefit. But then now keeping the station keeping at least for maybe half a year or a year depends on the mission cost. So no, potentially this may be some, some, some somewhat. In, it's not permanent station keeping, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you use the iron propulsion for to, for station keeping. But you could also just have a set of multiple craft yes. orbiting, and you have enough of them that you always have coverage. For example, yeah, above the poles. That's more economic, so right. And you could do, instead of having your spacecraft, you were saying they could all kind of launch together and then glom together. They don't necessarily have to. They could stay separated. And you could be sending them around one after mm -hmm. like a string of pearls. Right. In the past, we discussed about having four of those spacecraft. Uh, what would be the reasonable number? How, on, on what scales do we expect variability, right? Good question, so. yes. Uh, yeah, and, and I mean, four is a good number to start with, but why yeah. not have a thousand, right? right. <laughs> So another question I have is if you, from a technology point of view, and we're still doing tech demos for even the 50 meter size sail, uh, but could uh, how large could you extrapolate one could build one of these sails? Because if you take a, a 50 kilometer sail could manage a one kilogram spacecraft. If you want a 10 kilogram spacecraft, you got to go to 500 meters, which is a half a kilometer. And is that realistic to build today? Um, for five kilogram spacecraft, for, for, 10, 10, kilograms. Kilograms. for, for 10 kilograms uh, spacecraft, uh, the truss length would be uh, 25 to 30 meters. So it's not. No, no, you said yeah. in one of your slides you had 50 meters squared was uh, for one kilogram. That was. Um, um, that was done by That's other other demo. folks at the tech, tech demo. It's, it's not it's not ours. So it was done by by, by somebody else. 
so for them they use the different sail material they use different boom deployment so for them uh that was uh, i guess the real question is how large could one extract right. you know i mean you said one of the challenges is large clean rooms to, to assemble and build these things you know could you envision could you assemble them in orbit and do build a kilometer size one or i mean how would you do those so with the uh, thought about that with articulatable veins uh we um uh, we are capable of expanding the uh, booms uh, beyond 50, uh, 50 meters. Okay. Each each vein, 50 meters. Then uh, different deployment <coughs> mechanisms will be needed. First of all, uh, we will fold those kind of, uh, they'll be foldable. Yeah. Foldable once, once in space, they unfold this way and unfold in, in, in the plane. And so now the challenge will be occupying the launch vehicle, uh, uh, sort of uh, the fairing. And so we are scaled up for the uh, Starship, occupying the entire length of Starship uh, length. And so then we can actually deploy a sail up to 75 meters, uh, 75 meter uh, uh, boom size. So you need to get Elon to give you a launch. Right. For that spacecraft, <laughs> for that cell craft. Right. So, but that is possible. Uh, have not built it yet, of course. Yes. But deployment, uh, un un unfolding. And for, so now we are we are thinking that with the with the six to uh, twelve meters it's easy. We don't need to buy any to get anything else. So twelve meters it's reasonable easy. But then for to larger scale to expand it, it's multiple ways to do this. Ultimately, well, what we need to do is optimize area to mass ratio, as we discussed, right? So it's either going to it's either we if you want to fly a certain number of instruments. And so that fixed the mass of the spacecraft. Then the only way is to either get in close to the sun. So then we need to build to, to, to acquire access to sail materials that will allow us to survive. And the whole structure and the full avionics, everything of the instruments must also be able to survive that proximity. That's one way of larger, getting closer to the sun is one way. Second uh, answer is, uh, so the second way is to have larger sails, right? So you don't get close to the sun, but still you you increase the uh, the cell area, and so for that, at some point there will be challenges. Not now, but at some point, again deployment challenges, deploying and fixing them. Right. So in the maybe third way, as I mentioned, it's actually uh, to do in flight assembly. So when you fly a manageable sail craft with reasonable deployment of, of approach, once you accelerated the uh, structure now you can uh, dog the fuel cell craft they just and now they are moving at very high velocity but you have not you avoided going close to the sun they didn't burn and so that the deployment is actually you know the multiple ways of actually thinking about this and so i think we as we start approaching this road uh, uh we will start thinking about how to how to uh, we'll gain some gain some experience so we need to start flying essentially but uh those questions yeah when you fly a compact sp spacecraft that we launch with the chemical propulsion today, we know we have extensive experience how to operate those. Those gossamer structures, they're flaky at first. You just don't trust them. So, but I guess the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We need to start flying and start trusting those systems. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? from the hall or from online. Looks like uh, no other question. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Slava.